Today, we welcome back Eric Wilson, a former martial arts expert of over 24 years. A nation built on Protestant values, America, has now become saturated with spiritualism and Eastern mysticism. Through mindful meditation, Eastern philosophy, martial arts, Tai Chi, yoga, Reiki, and traditional Chinese medicine, Christians and non-believers alike are subtly indoctrinated into the pantheistic religions of the Far East. However, the scriptures do warn us, know ye not that your body is the temple of God. Brother Eric, welcome back. It's good to be here again, thank you. Well, let's start unpacking this experience that you've had as it relates to the scripture I just read. Growing up as a Christian, I had heard this verse, you know, we are the temple of God, but I didn't take it literally. Uh, so often we don't really believe that. It's sort of just a phrase. What I found though is from the Bible, as well as from other inspired writings, God dwells inside of each of us through His Word. That's right. So in like Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says, don't you realize that who you yield yourself a servant to obey, that's whose servant you become. That's your master. That's right. So if I yield to God's Word, God's Spirit comes into me. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. But if I'm yielding to the instructions of martial arts or Eastern mystics or any kind of new age or occult, when I yield, I'm opening that door for those spirits to come in and be active in my life. Now, many people are skeptics. They say martial arts is just a form of benign exercise. Yes. Tell me uh, if that's true. I, I want to show you, and, and on, on the documentary, we have many quotes. I just want to show you two quotes. Now, our viewers don't know which documentary you're, you want to yes. go ahead and tell us a bit about it? Okay. On the documentary that we did with Little Light Studios a number of years ago, it's called The Dragon Revealed. Um, on that series, we actually show many quotes from martial arts masters. But today I just have time. I just want to show two quotes. All right, let's start. Okay. The first quote actually is from a grandmaster named Gichin Funakushi. He says, spiritual development is paramount. Technical skills are merely a means to the end. This is from a 10th dawn. He is known as the father of modern day karate. Another gentleman, uh, Robert James Barati says, Zen offers an interesting perspective in the world of martial arts and spirituality because it becomes hard to see where the spiritual philosophy ends and the martial practice begins. So there is definitely a blend. You can't have one without the other. There's no, no way to separate it. You cannot separate the two. So where do these, I mean, where does this actually lead? Okay, so now we're the temple and then we go into these yoga and martial arts studios and could we consider those temples as well? Yes, I, I want to show uh, I want to show a photograph okay. of where martial arts began. Okay, uh, it's at the Shaolin Temple mm -hmm. in Hunan Province of China. All the martial arts in the world find their origins there, and a lot of people don't realize, but the the Shaolin Temple was originally a Hindu temple. Mm. So all of its roots came from India, and all of India's roots have come from Egypt. Yes. From Hermetica. Yes, yes. So, so there's a good line that's just traveling through history and transforming accor according to our, t our culture and our time. Yes, yeah. Satan just repackages the yeah. same lies as what he told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Master deceiver. Yes. So in that, in that photograph, which I'm going to let them show now that mm -hmm. we're looking at of the Shaolin Temple, there's something interesting. In that photograph, you see all of these monks coming out of the temple and they are holding a, an orange or a golden globe, an orb in their hand. And this photograph, I had actually purchased a book from the Shaolin Temple that the first Grand Master I was under had recommended. And when I saw this picture, I was like, what are they doing? I mean, they're not holding swords or spears or mm -hmm. any kind of fighting techniques. What are they doing? And I turned the page over and there it was a description in the Chinese language and underneath of it, it, it had been translated into English. Mm -hmm. And it shocked me what that picture actually said. It said, Chan Buddhism into all the world. Ah. So what the Shaolin Temple, their entire goal, martial arts was just a means to the end. Their purpose was to take Chan, which is what the Chinese call it, or Zen is what the Japanese call it, that Buddhism into all the world. 
They so, are evangelical. Exactly. So your instructor is actually a military arm of a religion that is then making disciples of everyone. Yes. I, yeah, I could see the parallel there because in yoga and Eastern meditation, there's also another word for Zen, which is prana. Yes. And it's all about taking your so-called breath and using it to exalt yourself and to unite with the universal God. Yes. Right. And what, what's, what's amazing to me is there's so much emphasis on breath in the martial arts and in yoga and in mm -hmm. Tai Chi mm -hmm. and in Chinese Qigong. And a lot of people don't realize why by doing the deep breathing exercises and the rituals that they promote, mm -hmm. it actually causes the brain to enter an altered state of That's consciousness. Right. Mm -hmm. And what happens is it shuts down the frontal lobe, your critical thinking. And when that happens, the brain becomes an open doorway for spiritual influences, not just from God, but from the devil and his fallen angels. Supernatural indeed. Yes, yes. I want to show a quote now from a Shaolin master that came here to the United States. He actually opened a school in New York City, and I've never been there, but my wife has. And I'm going to show just what he said. This is from an interview that was done with him. It says, Shi Yong Ming says that Chan, or Zen philosophy, is simple, that it is heart to heart and mind to mind. He then says he never tries to change others' beliefs. Shi Yong Ming wants everybody to have an open heart. That means an open mind. Right. That means take down the guard. Right. He wants everyone to have an open heart and to respect their own body as a temple. When I... It's, it's the same gospel but flipped upside down. It, it's like the Gnosticism that we've seen coursing through, yes. through media. And if you look at the picture of Shi Yong Ming, he's standing in his Dao Zhang, his studio, mm -hmm. his school there in New York. Look at the symbol that's behind him. Mm. It's a dragon. Mm. So if he says, my students, their body is being designed as a temple, a temple for who? For the spirit of the dragon. And we know from Revelation 12, that's Satan. We do, indeed. Shi Yong Ming goes on and says, let go of ego. Maintain perspective and let the mind be free and, and flexible. Well, we also hear that in, in psychobabble that comes from Jung and, you know, the yes. philosophers. It's not a coincidence. No. The ego that he's talking about there is speaking about the identity of the individual, who you are, who you identify yourself as. So that's what all of the Eastern mysticism, its whole goal is to make you non-dual where you don't identify yourself as an individual, but you become one with the universe, one with the, the universal consciousness. And the same happens in, you know, yoga. It's ego death. They constantly talk about that. And so as a yogi, you go in and your whole aim is, how do I get rid of this? How do I stop being this way? How do I, you know, have this ego death? And you, you also find that when they do uh, drugs, you know, yes. um, uh, ayahuasca and different things like this, the whole point is to kill, obliterate the identity that God gave you. In the Chinese martial arts, they actually have at higher levels, they have something where they call silencing the chattering monkey. The chattering monkey is who they say, that voice that you hear in your head all the time. Mm -hmm. You want to get rid of that. Which so, is the voice God gave us. Right. A conscience. A conscience. And it's also even your own thoughts. They want to get rid of that. And they say, when you get rid of that, then you start becoming enlightened. Because you're a blank slate and they can write upon right. you whatever they choose. Right. I want, to show, uh, I want to show you another quote. This is from a grandmaster named Masoyama. He was a Japanese uh, grandmaster. Tenth Dawn, his nickname was called the God Hand because he could kill full-grown male bulls hmm. with one punch. Incredible. Um, but I want to show you because a lot of people, they still, they still struggle to understand that you can't separate the physical from the spiritual side of it. Okay. In this quote, he says, the man who wants to walk the way of hmm. karate cannot afford to neglect Zen and spiritual training. And Jesus tells us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the word of God. So Zen is another way. And they all believe that if you follow that way, just like in Hinduism or any of the other, you know, ancient uh, pagan religions, they say you still achieve godhood. You still make it to heaven. 
There's just, no wrong path. You can be murderous. Right. You could be a thief. You could do whatever it takes, but you're still holy because that's, the God is already within you. That's right. And you just have to awaken that. You have to have your eyes open through these practices so that you know what they say that you are a God. So one of the questions I know a lot of people have asked is, what is Zen? You know, when I was growing up, you didn't hear about Zen. But now it's like you go to Target or you go into any housewares, you know, shop or trinket store and you'll see Buddha statues and little emblems with Zen or find your Zen in this kind of milk or this kind of coffee. And even if you're not exposed to actual martial arts, they have, you know, cartoons for kids. Yes. Master Shifu, you know, Kung Fu Panda and all these yes. things. And the kids are themselves being trained up. So a lot of people, they, they, they wonder, what does Zen mean? I mean, we sort of think, oh, it means peace and happiness, but I want to show you what they actually say. This is a quote um, from Hindu and Buddhist sources. It says, the term Chan, which is Chinese, or Zen, which is Japanese, originates from the Hindu Sanskrit language, the word meaning dhyana, which literally means meditation. Yes. So. The Chinese have moving meditation in Tai Chi or in their forms that they do in, in Kung Fu. The Japanese have moving meditation in the kata that they do in their forms. It says the, this form of meditation is described as a lucid awareness said to be achieved through focusing on a single object for a prolonged period of time. This is similar to the training that I received when I was taking up yoga, you know, the eight limbs of yoga. Yes. And the meditation is such a, a key part of getting you to shift your allegiance from God, the creator, to God of, of Satan, really, the, the yes. serpent. And there's a lot of serpent worship that goes on. I wanted to circle back, though, because okay. we talked briefly about prana. Yes. Is this the same as chi? Yes. Chi and ki and prana and there's another word in Europe that was developed called Oregon energy. I haven't heard that. Um, vibrational energy. Yes, yes. Free, it's all the same thing. And it's become a part of our vernacular. We're always saying, oh, that, that guy has good vibes or, yeah. you know, your vibration is too low. It's, it's just yeah. prevalent now. What, what they've done is they've made it a pantheistic God. Like to the, to the Taoist, the Chinese Taoist, the yin and yang is a symbol of the Tao, which is said to symbolize or stand for what they call God, but it's a pantheistic God. Right. They say that God is in the rock, it's in the tree, it's mm -hmm. in every human being, it's in every animal. When I was in the martial arts, I can remember after black belt level, you know, the grandmaster would, would have the black belts come out and we would go out and stand, they called it tree hugging, but you would stand in a Qigong stance and you'd put your hands in a certain position and your feet in a certain position and arch your back and right. you would visualize uh, the energy moving through the channels, the governing you know, vessel and the conception vessel, and you would try to absorb this chi energy from the tree. So it's really a spirit. Yes. Yes, the last Grand Master that I was under finally opened that up. He said, to the beginner, we tell them it's inner strength. You know, to an intermediate, we tell them it's breath. He said, but to a disciple, we reveal it's spirit. The truth. The truth. Now in yoga, we also have what's called samadhi. I should say, I shouldn't say we anymore, but as a, you know, yes. a teacher at that time, that was something that we, our goal was samadhi. Break that down for us. Okay, well, I'm gonna show you this from a, a quote from them. Um, samadhi is actually a Hindu word that means an intense concentration that is achieved through meditation, at which point a union with the divine is said to be achieved. Yoking. Yoking, which is what the word yoga means. But the scary thing is, is when you see, you know, Japanese or Chinese, you know, masters or even students and they're doing, they're seated in a, a lotus position and they're meditating and they're saying om and they're breathing and they're focusing. All of that is to open the mind, to take down the guard and to allow something else to get in. So it's a form of a, a seance. It's yes. a ritual. Yes. And it's an incantation to invite the inhabitation yes. of a spirit within you. That's exactly right. And that's right. the union. That's exactly right. And it, it takes a process. You know, some people, they can get it in a few years. Other people, it might take 10, 15, 20 years. 
But that is the entire goal, is a union with this pantheistic God that they call the Tao. The other dichotomy of this is that, you know, we don't do our research. We just trust and we go with the flow. Go with the flow. You hear that constantly yes. said and repeated when you're in classes, whether it's martial art, arts or, or yoga. Uh, let's talk about whether or not a Christian can do these practices and still serve Christ. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet do not the things that I say? The word Lord in Hebrew actually is Adonai. It means sovereign king. How can you call me your king, but you won't obey me? If the martial arts is telling us to do something that God's word tells us the opposite, we have to make a choice. Am I going to serve this master or am I going to serve another? So no, you can't. If Jesus said, turn the cheek, and martial arts says block and counter. If Jesus says don't bow to someone else and martial arts says bow to your sensei, bow to your sifu, bow to your opponent, um, we're automatically choosing to obey the voice of the serpent instead of obeying the voice of God. So how high did you yield to the opposing God here? Um, I, wanted, I wanted rank. You know, when I made black belt, um, I was the fifth person in 30 years. I remember the grandmaster came to me and he said, you know, Eric, he said, what do you want to do now? It took 14 years to get to that point. He said, what do you want now? And I looked at him and I said, I want what you have because he could do things that were supernatural. So you made an idol out of your Sifu. Yes, and I made... And you were covetous. I actually made an idol out of the martial arts. I wanted the ability. I wanted the power that I saw. Did you receive power? Yes. Tell but us a little bit about that. Different people in martial arts express or they manifest the gifts of this chi in different ways. Um, I remember the, the first grandmaster that I was training under, one day he was in there teaching a class and he, he was telling this person how to hit and strike this, this heavy bag. It was like a 75 or 80 pound heavy bag. And you know you could tell the young man was you know trying his best. And when I say young man, he was in his 20s or, or early 30s. And I remember the grandmaster went over and he grabbed it with his left hand, the bag, a leather bag, and he lifted it up with one hand and he shook it. This thing was 75 or 80 pounds. He said, "That's the kind of power you've got to have." And you know, and everybody that was there in the studio that day, they were just like, "Wow, did you see that?" We had other men that I had trained under um, where they would break coconuts you know, with two fingers. Uh, you know, a, a, a coconut is harder than the human skull. They'd set it up there and they could smack it. Two fingers. With two fingers and shatter and the I coconut. And I've seen children when they're graduating or there's sort of like a performance that they put on for their parents to come and see how they're, you know, progressing in, yes. in their martial arts. I've seen them break boards and cylinder blocks. Is that smoke and mirrors or is that power? Sometimes it's smoke and mirrors. Uh, how so? If you see somebody and they've got like five boards or they've got six boards and there's a pencil in between each board, there's some physical strength that's necessary, but there's also uh, mechanical. So laws of physics take over yes. and it gives you the appearance that you have yes. power and then you start to identify yes. with that and seek it. But on the real side, mm -hmm. there's men that take their hands and they can shatter cinder blocks. I mean, you go up out in the backyard and grab a cinder block and they take their palm and just smack it and shatter it. Is it actually them or is it something else? It's the spirit that's in them. And it, it's actually, there's a, one of the questions that came to my mind when I was in martial arts, because I did, I did Chinese martial arts, but I also had a, a first degree black belt in seven styles. And some of those styles were Japanese or, or Okinawan. And in the, the Okinawan system of karate do, I asked the instructor one time, I said, what does karate mean? He said, it means empty hand. I was like, oh, you know, I get to use my hands as weapons instead of holding a weapon. But then we trained with tonfas, we trained with swords, we trained with bow staffs, we trained with knives and I was like, and, and nunchucka. And I yeah. was like, wait a minute, I thought this was empty hand. Why are we training with weapons? And it was not until after I made discipleship that the light came on. And I shouldn't say that. It was, it was a demon that was just allowing me, it's time to give him this information. The secret knowledge. Yes. The reason that it's called empty hand is because for me to, 
you know, if you tell me, Eric, would you hand me, you know, that, that plant, and I reach for it, my mind had to tell my hand to reach for that. When I empty my hand, that means my mind is becoming empty. Another mind directs my hand what to do. Mm. So empty hand, it was not simply just no weapons. It means you're emptying yourself. That's why they teach you to empty your mind is so another mind can take possession. So when that happens, it's not your hand anymore because a demon goes into your hand and your hand can become like a piece of lead. Mm -hmm. I have seen, you know, just some extraordinary examples of this power that they have where they will punch within like an inch of your chest yes. and, and actually cause your heart to stop. Yes. Yes. I, there's no law that could explain no, that. There, there's no physical law that, that can do that. It's only a spiritual event that causes that. It's a spiritual power that is causing that. Just like Masoyama, when he would punch a full grown bull, there's no way that any human being could punch a bull and drop it dead with one punch. That was a spirit, a demon that was causing that event to take place because he had yielded himself over and over and over again for so many years. And the, the more you yield, the more power is given to you. So again, what's the end game for this whole process? Why take on this spiritual form? The end game is to connect man with God, with what they call God, which is not, it's demons, it's evil spirits. There's a lot of symbology that they use, uh, symbols that I've seen in yoga, that I've seen even in, you know, uh, Hitler's regime. Yes, the swastika. And when I was in India, the swastika was actually kind of reversed. Yes, the and direction. Even the word Aryan for them, they said it came from us. So the movement itself of, you know, what Hitler did was satanic and spiritual in nature. It wasn't just racism. It's funny because the first time that the light that, that the warning bells started sounding. I remember we were sitting at an advanced class. It was late at night and the Grandmaster had gotten a videotape from the Shaolin monks in China. And it showed them out on this field, they were doing a demonstration for the Chinese people. And you know how like when, the, when you have a football game and at halftime the band goes out and they'll march. Pomp and show, the and full they, regalia. And they'll make shapes. Yes. And that you go, oh, that's so neat. I remember seeing all these Shaolin monks marching and doing these shapes and they did a swastika. And I was sitting there and I was probably a green belt or a brown belt, wasn't black belt yet. And I was looking and I thought, what does Hitler have to do with the Shaolin temple? What are they doing a swastika? So this, I didn't have any clue. But then the longer that I was in it, I started seeing the pentagram. That's a Hindu and a Buddhist symbol. The swastika is a Buddhist and Hindu symbol. The hexagram, the six-pointed star, is a Hindu and Buddhist symbol. All of these people, even Hitler, Adolf Hitler, they said he kept a copy of uh, a book called The Secret Doctrine from Madame H.P. Blavowski. It was beside his bed every night. He wanted what she was offering because it was occult power, and you didn't have to be morally good to get it. And that's, that's why people go after that. It's a power that doesn't it doesn't require you to give up carnal desires. Right, you just go all in for it. Yeah, so like in, in, in the Chinese, the original yin and yang, which I know our viewers, you know, we can see that picture um, there on screen. The original yin and yang was a circle divided equally into light and dark portions. The dark portion had a little bit of light in it and the light portion had a little bit of dark in it. That's what the Taoists say God is. He's, He's dark light and, and darkness. But we know that's not true. Those symbols of the yin and yang and the hexagram and the swastika, all of them have one meaning. It is the union of light and darkness. What they don't tell you is, is that light and darkness is actually flesh and spirit. That is exactly what God wants. He wants us to open our hearts through surrender and obedience and allow His spirit to live inside of us. That was probably the thing that, that really opened my eyes because I was struggling after 24, almost 25 years of doing this, my mind had become blinded. And one night I was looking at all these books that I had on martial arts and I kept seeing this over and over again. I was like, God, yeah, but it, this seems so reasonable. It seems scientific. 
and the Lord brought one verse, 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And it was like when that happened, it was like the wall of glass and illusion shattered. just shattered. It was like... Praise him. Yeah, I mean, it was like the light was just all through me and I was like, this is a lie. I saw it after all those years. God, we praise. Amen. We're starting to wind down here. Can you tell our audience about the documentary? Yes, the documentary we did, I think it was released in 2014. We did it with Little Light Studios. It's a two disc documentary. Um, the first disc I think is available uh, online and other places. Um, the second disc comes in a package when you get that from Little Light Studios. Well, we thank God for your presence. We thank him for your experience turning you around and Amen. using him for his glory. Amen. We do actually have it on Dare to Dream. It's a special feature. Amen. Yes. So any closing thoughts for our audience? I would encourage everyone that's watching right now, know that God literally wants to come inside of, and live inside of you. Jesus wants to live inside of you through his Holy Spirit. If we allow God to have access to our heart, it's like in Revelation chapter three, verse 20, it says, I'm standing at the door knocking. If you'll hear my voice and open the door, that means surrender and yield your will. He says, I will come into you and sup with you and you with me. That is what God wants from us more than anything else. If we will yield and surrender our will, our decisions to his. And when you do that, there's freedom, unbelievable freedom. His grace shall cover you and bless you. Amen. Your proof and testament to this. And the way that you said it just really reminds me of the scripture when he says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You've done that beautifully. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. As you have learned today, there is no such thing as a neutral spiritual experience. You're either yielding to spiritual darkness or the truth of Jesus Christ and his light. For an in-depth understanding, please check out The Dragon Revealed. It's a documentary available on Dare to Dream. We've only scratched the surface today. Until next time, please guard your temples, read your scripture, share the gospel with others. Jesus is the light, the way, and the truth. I'm Blessings Win, and this has been A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. <laughs>